Greetings! Welcome to Electronics 2. This is lecture number 43, and I am Bezad Rozavi. Today, we will look at an important and interesting effect in negative feedback systems, namely uh, the problem of instability. We will see that the negative feedback circuits that we have designed in the past and thought benefited from all the nice properties of feedback can become unstable. And by that we mean they can start oscillating and producing a signal that we don't even want. Now, before we go there, I wanted to show you a quick example of how this happens in actual life, something that you may have encountered before. So here I have a speaker here, and this speaker, which I will turn on now, is connected to an amplifier that amplifies this signal from the microphone. So you can see that as I turn up the volume, you can barely hear uh, my amplified voice from the speaker. Okay? So this is a common situation. You're at a concert. Uh, the microphone is picking up the signal from a guitar. And it goes through an amplifier and is broadcast by a speaker. Right? Okay. So now sometimes what we see is this. We're, everything's going well, but then suddenly you hear a noise. Why is that? Why is this uh, whistle coming out? Or, for example, it right now it looks, sounds fine, right? But as I bring the microphone closer to the speaker, you can see that uh, it could uh, generate a loud whistle, right? So why does it do that? So that's what we want to study. We see that here the system can generate an output even if I don't speak, right? So that's the purpose of our study. And we will see that uh, this is simply because uh, the feedback system uh, decides to become, to have positive feedback at some frequency, not negative feedback, even though we designed it to be a negative feedback system. Okay, so that's the basic idea. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, study uh, that. Uh, to get there, I need to make some observations. <clears throat> so let's start with some observations. Based on what we already know. Okay, well, here's our standard feedback system. Uh, X is going in and we chose this sign to be negative for negative feedback. Uh, we assume that A1 times K is positive, right? So these two have a positive product so that the overall feedback is still negative. And this is Y. So do you remember how we calculated the loop gain? We said break the loop anywhere you want, apply a test signal, go around the loop and come back. So let's do that. So here's how we did that. We set the input to zero. Uh, we go to the to the subtractor. Uh, for example, I can break the loop. Uh, maybe let me break it at the output of the uh, uh, feedback network. That's a little easier to see. So I'm going to break it right here, and I apply my test signal. This test signal goes through the subtractor through A1 and comes back through K. And that's what we call VF with respect to ground. And we said the loop gain is given by VF over V test times a negative sign. So we said the loop gain is equal to minus VF over V test. And in this case, it just comes out to be A1 times K, right? Because we have a negative here. So V of V test is minus A1 times K. We multiply that by another minus 1. So we get K times A1. Okay, as we've seen in the past. All right, so let's assume that this test signal is a sinusoid. And just follow the waveform around the loop and see what we should expect. Okay, so here's a, a sinusoid that I'm applying right here. 
This sinusoid comes out and enters the uh, inverting input of the subtractor. So at the output, this will be flipped upside down. So it will look like this. And then this goes through A1, gets amplified, goes through K, is attenuated, and comes out here. But because KA1 is always pretty large, we would expect that at this point, we still have this signal, but larger, right? So we have something like this, right? KA1 is uh, maybe 10, maybe 100, something, right? So it's large. Okay, so I, let's draw this on the same axis. Uh, so that we can keep track of things. So here's V test, V test, and VF is flipped upside down and larger in amplitude. So I will draw V test like this. Okay, so that's V VF. All right, so far so good. Okay, so these are the two waveforms that we apply and we observe as we go around the loop with the main input set to zero. This is a loop gain test, or you can think of it as a, a feedback sign test, right? We, we said that if the signal that's coming back opposes the signal that we applied, then the feedback is negative, right? You can see that they have uh, the one is the inverted version of the other. All right, so, so far so good. Now, let's uh, have a quiz. So we want to redraw this. So redraw if this amplifier has some delay. If A1 has some delay. And delay means that the output uh, appears later than expected, right? With some delay. So I'll give you one minute to think about it. Okay, so what do we have? Well, we'll draw this output, but with some delay, right? Because as the signal travels through A1, now it experiences some delay. So let's change the color to maybe this color, and here's what it looks like. So this whole blue waveform should be shifted to the right by some amount. So something like this, right? Okay, so this is the delayed version. All right, okay, so that's easy enough. But in the next step, I would like to assume that the delay through A1 is so large that uh, this new waveform, this delayed waveform, is delayed by half a cycle, half a period of the input or the output. All right, so we have a lot of delay. So let's redraw the whole thing uh, with all of these in mind and see what we get. This is the key point, so it is worth spending some time on. Okay, so here's our time axis. Here's our test signal, so V test. Okay. Originally, 
If there was no delay, the output looked like this. So I'll draw that as a dashed line, right? So that was the original VF when we had no delay. Okay, so this is VF with no delay. Uh, we get some uh, shrapnel here. So we have VF with no delay. But now I'm assuming that VF is delayed by half a cycle because of the delay through A1. So this whole thing is shifted all the way to here, right? By half a cycle. So let's draw that and see what we get. Okay, so the delay through A1 is so large that this is shifted over here. So it goes like this, right? And that means that over here, it looks like this. So this is VF with half cycle delay. Okay, so A1 is so slow, if you want to think of it that way, right? So slow, it has so much delay that by the time the signal comes out of it, it is delayed by half of the cycle of the, the signal, the period of the, the half of the period. All right, so now let's re-examine our understanding of the feedback system. Originally, we said uh, the feedback is negative because what comes back here in this test opposes the original signal, right? Okay, but now what has happened with, the, with this purple waveform with respect to the test signal? What has happened? So this is the new VF, right? Well, we see that VF and V-test have the same sign. They are not, VF is not opposing V-test. VF is enhancing V-test, right? So VF enhances V test. Okay? Whereas here, what I should say, just to make it clear, is VF opposes V test. So it seems that at this very high level of understanding, without thinking about details too much yet, what we observe is that because of the very long delay through A1, the signal that's coming back through the loop is no longer opposing the test signal, but enhancing it. So when it opposed V-test, we said the feedback was negative. Now that it enhances V-test, we should say the feedback is positive. So feedback is positive. Okay? All right. So I just want you to keep this picture in mind as we go and analyze the system very carefully. Uh, this is the key point behind instability in a feedback system, okay? The feedback, the loop is so sluggish, is so slow, there's so much delay around the loop that what we think should be negative feedback becomes positive feedback. All right? Okay. Uh, now, uh, we have said the uh, A1 delays the signal. Uh, you can also think of it as phase shift, right? Phase shift means that we have a sinusoid and we shift it this way or shift it that way, right? So you can think of it also as a phase shift. So delay and phase shift are not exactly the same, but for our purposes, we can consider them to be the same. So instead of thinking that A1 has a delay, we can also say A1 has some phase shift, right? You know that a simple RC circuit has some phase shift. You've seen that in uh, circuits 101 or 102 or something, right? So it's the same idea. Okay, so if this A1 or anywhere in this loop, we have a slow circuit, a circuit that uh, has a long delay or has a long, large, large phase shift, then we could be in this situation 
and in that case the system will not be stable. All right, so we'll have to uh, formulate that very carefully. Okay, so uh, let me see if I have anything else before I go to the analysis. All right. So, <clears throat> analysis for instability. Instability. All right, so we go back to our original feedback system. X here, a feedback factor here, and uh, instead of calling that A1, the feedforward amplifier, we now call it H of S. So still we can call it A1 if you want, but we attribute to it a transfer function. In other words, we're assuming that this circuit has some poles and zeros maybe. And that makes sense because in all the amplifiers that we have analyzed, all the amplifiers that we have built for this type of feedback system, surely we will have poles and zeros. So we can't say that the frequency response of the circuit is flat all the way to infinite frequency, right? There are some poles and some zeros in here, maybe even in here, maybe even in here, right? That will create all sorts of interesting effects. So we assume that this has a transfer function, H of S. Okay, so, so far nothing dramatic has happened. And what we know from the standard feedback system analysis is that Y over X is given by, remember, A1 divided by 1 plus K A1. So that would be H of S divided by 1 plus K H of S. All right? Okay, so that's fine. All right, so now I will perform a test. And in this test, I want to do this. I want to apply a sinusoid to the input at some frequency which we call omega zero. I can do that, right? The sinusoid would be something like x of t equals a cosine of omega zero t. Right, I can apply that some frequency which we call omega zero. Could be 10 megahertz, it could be 100 megahertz. All right, and uh, this uh, system, this equation says that whatever you apply to the input appears at the output with this type of transfer function, right? And uh, because the input is a sinusoid, we know how to handle the situation, right? So. That means that y over x, because we are dealing with only sinusoids, will be given by h, and s is now replaced with j omega zero. So s is equal to j omega zero here and also here. Okay, for a sinusoid, if you write this as exponentials, you have only j omega zero in the two exponentials of cosine, right? There is no uh, sigma, there's no damping factor, there's no uh, uh, real part to the, expansion, uh, the exponential expansion of this. All right, so that's what we have. And uh, now, we have the circuit, right? We built it, we applied this test, we applied the sinusoid to the input at this frequency. And then we went and calculated these things. I know how to calculate H of S, right? We found we had frequency response analysis before. So I plug it in here, I plug it in here. I replace S with J omega zero. I have a certain K. Let's say K itself is just a simple constant. It's not frequency dependent. In most cases, that's true. So it's like 0.1, right? Just 10%. Okay. But what I noticed after I did the calculations was that K times H calculated at this frequency, at the input frequency, gives me minus one. All right? So it's not the magnitude, it's the whole thing, right? K times H at J omega zero, it could be a complex number, but it's not. At this frequency, it just happens to be minus one. So then what happens? 
All right, so if that's the case, uh, the denominator is zero, the numerator is not zero, because uh, if h is zero, then kh would be zero, kh would not be minus one. So this is not zero, this is zero, so the result is infinity. Okay, so we have infinity here. Isn't that strange? So that says that if we satisfy this condition in response to the sinusoid that I have here, the output will be infinitely large, right? So the output will be something like this. So even if the input is very, 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 very small, the output will be very, very, very large. All right, so this is what we call an unstable system. So we say unstable loop. Okay, so when this happens, when uh, the loop gain, remember this loop, the loop gain, right, Ka1, Kh, when the loop gain is equal to minus 1 at some particular frequency, omega 0, then the system becomes unstable. And that really means that even if this input is very, 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 very small, this output is still very, very large. So the, the system is really generating its own component and uh, uh, acting like an oscillator. All right, so, so we say good for building oscillators. So if you want to build an oscillator, that's exactly what we will try to do, right? We design the circuit so that this happens, and when this happens, the circuit oscillates. The circuit produces a waveform without an input. Right? Remember when I tested my microphone against the speaker, we saw that even if I'm not talking to the microphone, uh, there is that whistle, there is that, no that sound, because the system was oscillating. So, yes, you can build an oscillator like that. And when we are designing oscillators, yes, that's what we follow. But this is not good when we're trying to build a feedback amplifier. So this is bad for building amplifiers. So as you can see, regardless of what you want to build, whether you want to build an oscillator or an amplifier, we do need to perform this analysis and see whether this happens or not, right? For amplifiers, we don't want this to happen. For oscillators, we do want it to happen. So that, uh, that requires an exact analysis of the loop. Okay, so uh, let me make sure that I have covered everything so far. All right, let's carry on this, uh, this thought process a little more so that this becomes clearer in our mind, okay? All right, so I'm going to say that let's take a closer look. So this is what we have found out so far, right? So if k h of j omega 0 equals minus 1, then the loop is unstable. All right? Okay. Now, uh, if you are really interested, it turns out that this is not exactly true. There are some interesting cases where we have to be very careful, but for now, just let's take this as is, okay? So if that's the case, then this is the case, all right? The loop is unstable. Okay, uh, so this means that to avoid instability, oops, to avoid instability, uh, I need to avoid instability We need to ensure that kh of j omega is not equal to minus is not equal to minus one for any omega, right? So for any omega that we pick, 
this should not become equal to minus 1. So that that denominator doesn't become equal to 0, so that the closed loop transfer function does not go to infinity. All right, so that's what we need to ensure. And we will have to see exactly how that's possible, okay? But for now, this is the, what, the message that comes out. All right, now, uh, I have this number, kh of j omega 0 equals minus 1. It just happens that this number is not complex, right? Even though the argument is a, an imaginary number, so we have this h, this big h, a numerator, a denominator, we replaced s with j omega, we did all the simplifications, and it just happened that k times that is minus 1. But in the general case, I can say it's a complex number, right? In fact, maybe just a little less than this frequency, or a little more than this frequency, it is a complex number. But in any case, if I have a number like this, a, a relationship like this, I can say this is equivalent to the magnitude of this number is equal to 1 and the phase of this number is equal to 180 degrees. Is that okay? It's the same thing, right? So if, if I give you a number with whose absolute value is 1 but whose phase is 180 degrees, that turns out to be minus 1, right? So it's the same thing. And uh, this perspective helps us a lot in analyzing uh, these loops and understanding what, when they become unstable and how we can avoid instability. All right, so keep these two conditions in mind. And uh, now let's go and see uh, exactly what we would expect. So let me try the loop gain test again. Try the loop gain test again. So what we did on the previous slide, remember? We said we want to open the loop, so we set the input to zero. Here's where we open the loop. We apply a test signal. We go through H of S, A1, right? We come back, come back uh, through, we have F. Uh, well, we have K also. That's not a big deal, so let's put K here. And let's assume that this test signal has a frequency of omega zero. Okay? So I'm applying a sinusoid here with a frequency of omega zero. I can do that, right? Simple sinusoid at the frequency of omega zero. And I follow the signal as it travels around the loop. So from here to here, what happens? It just gets inverted, right? Because we're subtracting this from zero. So it gets inverted, it looks like this. Then it goes through H of S and K. So what happens? K times H, calculate omega zero, is minus one. So from here to here, we have a gain of minus one. So this signal will be multiplied by minus one. So it is flipped again. So what we see here looks like this. So now you see why the system is unstable, right? What's coming back here? is a, an exact copy of what we applied. Uh, what's coming back here is enhancing what we applied. It's not opposing what we applied. So because the phase shift from here to here is 180 degrees, this circuit is so slow that it has shifted the signal by 180 degrees from here to here, right? Because this loop is so slow, the feedback came out to be positive instead of negative. And that's how the system oscillates. So uh, Vf Vf in this case 
enhances the test feedback is positive at a frequency of omega zero, right? We don't know what happens at other frequencies. Maybe nothing happens at other frequencies. Maybe this, this condition doesn't hold at other frequencies, right? But at this frequency, what we know is that uh, the gain from here to here is minus one, meaning that the absolute value is one and the phase shift is 108 degrees. So at this frequency, we have shifted the signal so much that by the time it arrived here, it became in, it flipped, it became inverted. So now it agrees, it enhances the input. So the feedback is positive and the system is unstable. Okay, so I hope uh, this perspective and this perspective are not confusing you. Okay, so this is from the closed loop calculations. We just looked at the closed loop calculation and we saw that uh, indeed when the denominator is, uh, when this is minus one, denominator is zero, the gain is infinity, so anything here gives us an infinite output. On the other hand, here, we didn't look at from the x to y uh, path. Rather, we said, uh, let's just look at the loop gain, which happens to be the same thing that we found before. And we see that the loop gain it has a magnitude of one, a phase shift of 180 degrees. So uh, what it does, it makes the feedback positive. All right? Okay. So now, in fact, I can attach these two together now. I have a loop gain test. On the previous slide, I had a closed loop system test. Now let me try to show you how both of these agree with each other. So, here's the basic idea. Let's go ahead and examine the closed loop system in the time domain. All right? Okay, so that should be easy enough in the time domain. All right, so we'll take different snapshots of the closed loop system as time goes by. I take a picture at time zero, and another picture a little later, another picture a little later, and I see the waveforms in the loop and see what happens. All right. So at time zero, here's what we have. We have our feedback system H and K, and we built it to look like a negative feedback system when we started out, right? And at low frequencies it is, so X and Y. And at time zero, I begin to apply a sinusoid. So here's my sinusoid at the frequency of omega zero. Let's say that uh, this divide, this subtractor is a very simple circuit, doesn't have any delay or anything. So right around that time, this waveform also appears here. So right here, I have this waveform. Okay, all right. So now uh, let's wait a little while and see how this waveform propagates around this loop. So let's take a picture again. Here's the circuit again. So we have X going to the subtractor, going to H, coming back through K to the input, minus plus, and this is Y. So here's what we have in terms of waveforms. Okay, so we still have our input. The input looks like this. Uh, this has come here, so Right here, we still have this. And now, this has had the chance to propagate through H and K. So what do we get here? This waveform, as it propagates through H and K, because it's at, fre at the frequency of omega zero, it will have to have a gain of minus one. Or you can say 
again a 1 and a phase shift of 180 degrees. So by the time we get here, the waveform looks like this, right? It's multiplied by minus 1. Okay, all right, so we can say this is a picture taken at some other time. So T equals T1, just some time, right? It doesn't matter really. And now I'm going to take one more picture, a little later. So a little later, this is what I see. All right, so we've got H, K, and X and y and the waveforms look like this so x gives, has that input at omega zero the feedback has come back and it is inverted it has the same amplitude as this guy because the gain through this was one right but the phase is shifted by 180 degrees now the subtractor says well i got a signal here i got a signal here they have equal amplitudes, but one is the opposite of the other. So when I subtract them from each other, the result will have twice the amplitude. So this one will be twice as large. Okay, so now you can see what's going on for the closed loop system. And the closed loop system keeps building up this waveform. This waveform keeps getting larger and larger. Now, this propagates through these two, comes here. <coughs> with again a minus one. So a moment later, this will be bigger. I subtract this from this, this will be even bigger. This goes, gets flipped, it becomes bigger, and this continues to grow, right? So if we had no imperfection in the system, this amplitude would just grow to infinity. Of course, it's limited eventually by the power supply voltage or some other mechanism in the circuit, but we can see that this can grow. Right? And that's how the system becomes unstable, and that's how the system becomes oscillatory. All right, so we have uh, built a system, and unfortunately, because this condition holds at some frequency, the circuit begins to oscillate at that frequency. Now, you may think that, well, it seems that I need to have this input to have this output, right? It turns out that, that actually that's not necessary. So without going through details, it's a little beyond the scope of this course. Even if I remove this and have some noise in the system, uh, and there's noise always at some frequency omega zero, this will, the noise will build up and it will turn into oscillation. So we can build an oscillator like this. But our objective right now is to avoid oscillation. So we want to make sure that this does not happen. All right? Okay. All right, so that was the basic understanding of the situation. Um, now, to be able to analyze these carefully and find the conditions that my circuit has to satisfy so that we don't have oscillation, uh, I need to review both these rules quickly so that when we analyze circuits, we understand. So let's uh, quickly review Bode's rules for construction of uh, frequency response. Now, when we studied frequency response some lectures ago, I showed you Bode's rules for the magnitude response, remember? So I'll just summarize that in this plot. So we have omega, so let's say you have a pole here, you have a zero here. some transfer function, any transfer function you want to pick, right? If it has, for example, a pole here and a zero here, we said what happens is that <clears throat> when we reach the pole frequency, the slope decreases by 20 dB per decade, and when we reach a zero frequency, the slope increases by 20 dB per decade. So for example, it could be something like this. We get here, we go down at 20 dB per decade, and at this point, we have to go up, so that becomes flat, right? Because this, the contribution of this cancels the contribution of this, so this becomes flat. That's what we saw before. But Bode also offers us some rules for plotting the phase of a transfer function, right? A transfer function is a complex number. 
And if you have a complex number, so let's say a plus jb, for this complex number we have a magnitude, so magnitude of a plus jb is calculated as square root of a squared plus b squared, right? So if I have this big transfer function, I can simplify it to a plus jb, assuming that s is replaced with j omega. <clears throat> and that's how I calculate the magnitude. But I also have a phase, and the phase, so the phase of a plus jb is given by tan minus 1 of the imaginary component divided by the real component, b over a. And this is really because if you look, consider the complex plane, so this is uh, imaginary. If you plot the imaginary part versus the real part, so imaginary versus real, if you remember, so if I have a point here given by a and b, then in the polar coordinates, this length would be this value, and this angle would be this angle, right? So this is A here and B here. <coughs> so any transfer function that I give you will have a magnitude and a phase. So the magnitude plot is like this. We just need to be able to plot the phase also. That's necessary, as you might imagine, for instability analysis. Okay, so how do we do that? So I'll just follow this, and I'll show you how this works. Uh, so we plot phase this way. Well, strictly speaking, actually, it should be over here, because the, I'm plotting the negative side, so really the arrow should be pointing the other way. All right. So Bodhi says that uh, when we are plotting the phase of a transfer function, at the pole frequency, the phase has a contribution of minus 45 degrees. So right here. It says if you are at the pole frequency of omega p1, if you know there's a pole at this frequency, then what we know is that we have a phase shift of minus 45 degrees from this pole. All right. Bodhi also tells us that the phase uh, of the transfer function begins to deflect, begins to change about, at about one-tenth of this fre frequency. So around here, so the phase was zero uh, at around 0.1 omega p1, it started feeling the presence of that. So around here it started changing. It reached minus 45 degrees. And then it will go down, it will become more negative, and at about 10 times the pole frequency, the contribution reaches minus 90 degrees. So at about 10 times, so of course my scale is not very good here, but you can see the message. At 10 times that, we reach minus 90 degrees. That's for the pole. For the zero, it's the opposite, right? So for the zero, but maybe I'll <coughs> use a different color so that you can see better. So the zero is over here, right? Omega z. Bodhi says, at the zero frequency, we have a contribution of plus 45 degrees. Okay? And we begin to feel the presence of the zero at about one-tenth of the zero frequency. So if the one-tenth of the zero frequency is, say, around here, so point to one omega z, Around here, we begin to go up. We begin to feel the contribution of the zero to the phase shift. So we start going up. How much phase do we have right here? I need to draw this more accurately. So right around here, how much phase do we have? Well, um, if we had only a zero, the phase shift would be plus 45 degrees. But we already came down by this much to minus 90, so the zero wants to contribute plus 45. We already have minus 90, so we come to minus 45. So it's right here, the same as this. And then Bodhi says when we approach 10 times the zero frequency, 
uh, the contribution of the zero approach is plus 90 degrees. So at 10 times the zero frequency, the contribution of this guy is plus 90. We already had minus 90 from the pole, so we approach zero. Okay, so that's this is a quick summary of what Bodhi tells us about the phase shift of a transfer function. Uh, these are beautiful approximations, extremely important and extremely helpful in analyzing complex systems. So next time we'll pick up from here and see uh, what conditions we need to make sure that a given feedback circuit is stable. I will see you next time.